We're going to take some time to answer the email questions that you've sent in. And this first one, Pat, in our Bring It On segment comes from Tom, who says, how do we know that God actually exists? Well, uh, if you begin to understand cosmogony, uh, you begin to understand something. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth shows forth his handiwork. So we see it all there in nature. You see it in you. You see it in, in the marvel of your body. You know, you have 500,000 uh, sensors that go between your eyes and your brain. 500,000 of them. Your brain is so complex, it would take a whole battery of computers to even come close to doing what your brain can do. But at the very beginning, we believe the, uh, the whole universe started with an explosion that's known as the Big Bang. And astrophysicists that I had the privilege of talking to said, now listen, at that moment, I get this, if the material in the Big Bang had been off by 10 to the 28th power, that's 10 with 28 zeros after it, if it had been off one fly speck of an atom, too much or too little, the universe as we know it couldn't exist. There would be either not enough gravity uh, and it would all fall apart, or there would be too much gravity and it all shrink down on itself. It had to be precise, and that was 14 billion years ago. And you go down the list of things that were so miraculous of how this earth is, and when you begin to see that, there has to be a creative a person, a creative genius. I remember reading the encyclopedia, an article that said, well, there were 5,000 different combinations uh, in, in a human uh, gene and uh, said, it, it, when evolution saw that, it did the following. I think you idiot, evolution saw 5,000 different combinations of genes? Of course not. It had to be a creator. The heavens declare it. Your hand declares it. Your being, your eyes, your, your heart, your endocrines, everything that's making you up had to show a creative genius. And it couldn't possibly have come together spontaneously. All right. Okay, this is Carol who says, I saw on another Christian program that celebrating Christmas isn't considered Christian. What are your thoughts? Well, Christmas, let's face it, is a winter solstice. It's a pagan uh, event. It is. But the church Christianized a lot of these things. And uh, chances are the shepherds were out in the field and they were given watch. They weren't out there in the middle of winter. Probably it was spring. It could have been some other time. But we have a day and we celebrate it and we say it's a mass for Christ. So it's not going to hurt you to do it. But uh, the history doesn't necessarily back it up because it doesn't comport with the biblical account when you look at all the five points. But does that that your faith doesn't depend on when Christmas takes place. It depends on the fact that there was a person who lived whose name was Jesus, who, who lived and died and rose again from the grave. That's what's important. Okay, this is Shanoa who says, can I just start reading the Bible from John or the beginning or wherever I want to? Or do I have to wait for God to tell me what to read? <laughs> if so, how can I hear God? I need direction. I'm at a low point in my life. God will speak to you out of his word wherever you start. The Gospel of John is nice because it's easy to understand. It's easy Greek. It's easy English. And <clears throat> it's a good way to start. Uh, but you can dip into the Old Testament. You can read Proverbs or Psalms. Or you can start in the, in the Genesis account and read that. Then read a book in the uh, New Testament and then balance them off. But the big thing is let the Bible speak to you. If you have one verse and it talks to you, well, meditate on that verse and let the Lord enrich it in your heart. But you don't need permission, and you don't need some Bible study, and you don't need some preacher telling you when to do it. You let the Lord show you. He'll show you. But just pick up the Bible and start. But yes, John's a good place. Genesis is a good place. You know, you can <laughs> it's find It's all good. It's all good. All right. <laughs> okay, this is Marie who says, I have two childhood friends who never got married. They recently told me that the Bible does not mention about being single, and they feel churches don't offer anything for singles. They're discouraged. Any suggestions? Wait a minute. 
they're living together, but they say that no, they're... No, I think they're just friends who happen to be... Just friends? Yeah, yeah. I don't mean like male-female friends. I just think two single friends that never got oh, married. They, they never got married. Mm -hmm. I thought they were like living together. Never no, married. I don't okay, think they so. just All right. Hey, the Bible doesn't talk about singles. It talks about people. And, you know, there are men and there are women. There are women who do marvelous things. There are men who do marvelous things. The Apostle Paul uh, was a bachelor, and he, he mentions the mm -hmm. fact, I, yes. I never had a wife. I was free to take a wife like Peter and the other apostles, but I didn't do it. So he was single. Uh, so there are many other people in the Bible who are single. I don't know what you're talking about. They're not, they don't mention singles. Of course they're there. They're God. They're people. God deals with people, and he loves people. Wow. All right, whatever. Okay, this is Ed who says, Mark 838 says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father. What does it mean to be ashamed of Jesus? Can you explain the scripture? Are you kidding? Uh, you go into a secular environment and you start talking about Jesus and, and people make fun of you and so you don't have any, you don't have the fun made of you so you keep your mouth shut and they ask you about it. You, Apostle Peter, you remember the little serving girl said, I thought you were with him. No, I wasn't with him. Yeah, you were. I saw you. No, I wasn't. And he started cursing. That's ashamed of Jesus. But the Lord forgave him. He said, all right, now strengthen your brethren. God will forgive everything, including that. But it's, it's a natural thing in a sinful world to, you know, keep your head down and not want to stick it up and get it knocked apart by by the scorn of, uh, of, of doubters. So, you know, that's what it means. And there's not one of us that hadn't had that problem, but God will forgive it.